But isn't it interesting, watch this, that we will end on our actual Bible study night. Tuesday night will be day 28. Amen. Our association starts on Wednesday. Amen. At the um, Antioch Baptist Church. Um, pastor Sean Atkins is the pastor. Amen. Amen. We want to go and be supportive of our association in their first quarterly, in the first quarterly session. Amen. 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 It's team time. Team time. Team time. Team time. Amen. Amen. I'm gonna wear my team time sweatshirt on Wednesday to the association so they don't bother me. So I don't have to come up into the pulpit. Seven o'clock, seven o'clock, seven o'clock on Tuesday. Amen. Amen. Wednesday, Antioch, seven o'clock, seven o'clock. Amen. 7 p.m. on 125th Street. Amen. Right past Broadway. It's great to be back, back, back on Broadway. Anybody know what movie that's from? Carver, you know? What movie is that from? That's right. Mr. Magoo's A Christmas Carol. <laughs> I used to make them watch that every Christmas, y'all. Amen. That's why. Amen. Amen. Destiny used to come over, but she said, I can't do it no more. I can't do it no more. <laughs> Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you even for this moment and this time. Give us, God, and grant us what we need from this lesson on today. As we, as your children, want to become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. When, when I was a young guy, y'all, you know, I used to like to buy old cars and fix them up and sell them. I would, I would buy old cars. I would find old, raggedy, beat-up cars, and I would buy them. And a friend of mine had a shop, and we would go down to the shop, and we would work on the cars, and we would fix them up and sell them. We were always looking for a bargain because we like to buy old cars, fix them up, and sell them. And, and we found this car one time, this Volkswagen. It was a Volkswagen. Guy wanted two hundred dollars for it, and it was reasonable. It was reasonable, um, but but um, you know, didn't look like much. Had a f flat tire. So I knew I was going to have to buy a tire. Um, but I had bought another Volkswagen the same year um, that needed an engine. So I had a lot of parts that I could fix this Volkswagen up with. And so I got them to sell it for $100. <laughs> I said, man, I can't give you $200, so that's too much work. And so he sold it to me for $100. I took it for $100. We towed it to the shop. And we began to work on it. We began to put things on it and stuff. We checked the engine. Everything in the engine was good. Oil was good. Transmission good. Everything. Everything was good. And and we, we fixed it up and, and, and we got all the dents out of it. We painted it and stuff. Boy, car looked good, y'all. I said, ooh, we're going to make us some money on this car because I can sell this car for probably $1,000. But when we went to crank it, y'all, it wouldn't turn on. We went back, we checked the engine, we checked the, the battery, we checked everything, went to crank it, it wouldn't turn on. We went back, Jeff, we checked everything. Melvin, I checked everything. We checked everything from bumper to bumper on this car. Everything was right on this car. This car should start. We went back to crank it. And then my friend Calvin said, have y'all checked the gas tank? We had done all this work on this car, never checked to see whether or not it had gas. Huh? Watch this, watch this, watch this. My, 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 it, uh, I discovered that the reason this car wouldn't run was because it was merely out of gas. So we went to the gas station. And you know, you remember those $5, 
uh, those five gallon gas cans, well, you could get five gallons of gas for a dollar and 50 cent back then because gas was 33 cents a gallon. And so we went and got, filled up the gas thing, got, and put it in there, and that car cranked. It cranked, it ran so smooth that we didn't even really want to sell it at that point. We figured we had found us a bargain. Watch this, that, that, that's, that's what, when you look at Paul's experience in Philippians chapter three, uh, um, it looked good on the outside, Paul says, but on the inside, he was out of gas. A after, after, after he came to faith in Jesus Christ, Paul's whole value system was inverted. It changed. Paul says the things I formerly viewed uh, and looked upon as being needful and necessary to my life, I discovered they were not necessary. Our text this morning, y'all, takes us to where Paul left off in verse 11. Our text has two main paragraphs, verses 12 through 16 and verses 17 through 21. And in general terms, verses 12 through 16 explain Paul's perspective on the past, the present, and the future. He literally says, the Christian does not live in the past. Let me park there for a minute and help out Eddie all real quick. The Christian does not live in the past. Okay, let me park on this side. For a few minutes. The Christian does not live in the past. Stop allowing Satan to keep you in yesterday. When God has already told you, I have taken yesterday and put it behind my back. God literally says, I don't even remember it anymore. Okay? Watch this. Paul, Paul, Paul says, I need you to understand this. Listen to what he says. He says, literally, y'all, I'm not yet arrived, but I'm still striving. He says, I, I haven't gotten where I'm supposed to be. I'm striving to get there. Uh, I'm striving to lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. I do not consider myself to have obtained this. Instead, I am single-minded, forgetting the things behind and reaching for the things ahead. With this goal in mind, I strive for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Watch this, Paul, 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 Paul says, I need y'all to understand who and what I was, and I ain't thinking about that no more. I'm moving forward with the things in my life that are needful and necessary at this time. He says, I haven't arrived. I, I haven't arrived, y'all. He says, I have not arrived, but I have been saved. I have, Watch this. See, most folk think salvation is the ending point. You think that once you get saved, you've arrived. No, Paul says, I'm saved, but I haven't arrived yet. I realize I got a longer way to go. And what Paul literally is saying to us is, as hard as I worked to become what I used to be, I ought to work just as hard to become what I ought to be. I wish I had about eight people in here. As hard as I work to become what I used to be, I ought to be willing to work just as hard to become what I what I ought to be. He says, I, I haven't arrived yet. But watch this. But the process that commenced at my conversion, I understand it's not complete. In other words, Paul is saying, I got some more work to do. I, I, I got to work on this thing. I haven't arrived at the point that I need to have arrived at. I need to strive to move myself forward. Can I talk to you in here? The second goal towards which we are striving, watch this, is more specific. Watch this. We are striving together uh, toward that particular purpose for which God has called us. Listen to what the Bible says. We were saved unto good works. That's Ephesians 2, y'all. And we know that God has a particular plan for each one of us just as he had for Paul. That's Acts 9. Can I talk to you? 
We each have been saved for a particular purpose, for a particular role in the body of Christ and for a unique ministry to that body. See 1 Corinthians 12 when you get a chance. Paul expressed his eagerness to fulfill his calling, and we should do likewise. Jesus said to him, uh, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back. is fit for the kingdom of God. So I do not run uncertainly or box like one who hits only at air. Huh? Watch this. I have to understand who and what I am in Christ Jesus. If we're going to press on toward the goal before us, look at this, y'all, before us. I've got to press towards the goal, then we cannot keep looking behind. That's why Paul says, I need to let that go. Let, let that go. Huh? You got to let go things from your non-Christian past. And then you got to let go of things from your past as a believer. Can I talk to you in here? When Paul came to faith in Christ, he realized that all the things he was doing were for naught. He says, I got to let that go. And then Paul says, when I look back at my Christian past and fix my eyes on what lies ahead, I can't become obsessed with anything in my past, even my past as a believer. Huh? Anybody failed since you met Jesus? Huh? Anybody have some things in your life that are not what they should be since you met Jesus? Listen to what the Bible says. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to be sure of your calling and your election. For by doing this, you will never stumble into sin. For thus an interest into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be richly provided for you. Therefore, I intend to remind you constantly of these things, even though you know them and are well established in the truth that you now have. Indeed, as long as I am in this tabernacle... I consider it right to stir up, stir you up by way of reminder since I know that my tabernacle will soon be removed because our Lord Jesus Christ revealed this to me. Indeed, I will also make every effort after my departure that you have a testimony of these things. Can I talk to you in here? The things we are to remember are the things that will cause us to set our eyes on Jesus and to press on to the goal that he has for us. Those who are pure, truly mature, Paul writes, will concur with what he says. In other words, they will agree that salvation is just the starting point. Just the beginning of the race we are all to run. And that goal will not be reached until our death. They will agree that no Christian arrives in this life but keeps pressing on towards, towards the goal. Huh? You got to understand, those, those who think otherwise, God, God will correct. Huh? Watch this, watch this. You better begin to understand, my brothers and sisters, what God is saying to us. Let us live up to a standard that we have already attained. Paul has been encouraging us as saints to join him in pressing on in our faith, pressing on in our walk. We not finish this race. I don't care how old you are. You have not finished this race. How do you know, Reverend? Because you ain't laying in front of here. This race will not be finished for any of us until we are laying in front of here. Until someone stands over you and says, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Don't think you can just walk away from what God has called you to do. If I had somebody in here, folks talking about, I'm tired. You didn't, weren't tired enough not to get up this morning. Talk about, well, I've been doing this for a long time. Well, watch this. God might be moving you to something else, but if he moves you to something else, he'll move somebody in to fill your spot before he moves you. God doesn't work with vacancies. Can I talk in here? Watch this. And tell God, when God gets ready to move you, watch this. He moves you into the place he needs you for what he needs you for. And he's ready for you to move. He'll bring somebody to fill that place. Can I talk to y'all in the Lord's house? And when he brings them to fill the place, that's the sign it's time for you to move. 
Watch what the Bible says. The Bible says, be imitators of me. Be imitators of me. Watch carefully those who are living this way, just as you have us as an example. For many live about you, I've often told you, and, not even, and now even say with tears, as enemies of the cross of, tri of Christ. Their end will be destruction. Their God is their belly. They exalt in their shame. They think about earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we also await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform these humble bodies of ours into the likeness of his glorious body by means of that power by which he is able to subject all things. Watch out. Watch out for these things in your life, my brothers and sisters, for many live about whom I've often told you and now even say with tears as enemies, as enemies. He calls them enemies. Watch this. He literally says they oppose the true gospel of Jesus Christ. They were not preaching forgiveness of sins and assurance of eternal life by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They are enemies of the Lord's cross. Can I talk to you in here? If anyone wants to become my follower, this is what Jesus says. He must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, watch this, he will find it. There would be no denial of self for these counterfeit saints of whom Paul warned. You've got to understand, my brothers and sisters, I want to be a living epistle. I want to live my life so that people want to follow Christ because they see the life that I live, not the glamour, but the suffering, not the glory, but the shame. And when they see me living it to the glory of God, they say, wait a minute, I want to live that type of life is there anybody who showed up here this morning what a difference there is between a sinner and a saint that that's why that's why i tell folks stop stop calling yourself a sinner by saved by grace that's not what the bible calls you jesus says i call you saints but what, what, what does that mean pastor that that means that what was in my past i'm not going to allow it to have any impact on my future because I understand now I'm a saint. And how I identify myself will be how I try to live my life. See, if I'm a sinner saved by grace and that's how I identify myself, then when I sin, I won't feel conviction. If I'm a saint that's been washed in the blood of the Lamb, every time I sin, I will feel conviction in my spirit. Is there anybody in here who's ever been so convicted that you couldn't live with yourself until you got it right with God? I need somebody to shout glory in here and tell somebody I couldn't live with myself until I got right with God. I was so convicted in my spirit. Stop dwelling on your past. Huh? Because your past will make you ignore or deny your future. What Satan will say to you is you never can become that because of what happened in your life. You never can achieve that because folk ain't going to let you forget it. You can never overcome that because somebody's going to always be around to remind you. Can I help you in here? Watch this. I got somebody who overcame the world. So he can sure enough overcome my past. And no, no, I wish I had y'all in here. This God that we serve has overcome the world. He, he can sure enough overcome my past. No, 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 no. You better understand and you better start believing that in your heart. Now watch this. Satan's trying to keep you tied down because he understands if you ever get loose. Look at somebody and say, if I ever get loose, if I, if I ever get loose, watch this. There ain't nothing that can stop what God's going to do with my life if I become more Christ-like. Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. Knowledge puffs people up. Love builds people up. 
So what we want is the love of God in us. Stop standing in corners whispering about people's past. And start walking up to them, throwing your arms around them, and telling them you can make it. You, you can put your arm around somebody right now and just tell them you can make it. Who, whoever's around you, you don't even know what they're going through. Just tell them you can make it. You can make it. You, you can, no, you can make it. You can, you can make it. I, I, you ain't got to ask them nothing. You ain't got to know what they're going through. You, you can make it. Why? Because watch this. The God that you serve is building you up. He's building you up for something. Huh? Watch this. Watch this, y'all. 11 months ago, that didn't look like our apartment building across the street. 11 years ago, 11 months ago, it didn't look like what it looked like today. What you going to look like in 11 months? <laughs> 11 months from now, how is God going to have built you? Huh? Tell somebody, I ain't going to look like I look today 11 months from now. 11 months from now, I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be wiser. I'm going to be better. Because I'm going to be built up. Watch this. I'm going to not let my past handcuff me anymore. And whatever folks are saying about me, I'm going to walk around with my head up. Because greater is he that is in me. I'm going to walk around with my head up. Let folk know that the God I serve has forgiven me. And if you don't, that's between you and him. Because I'm pressing toward the mark. He's got a mark for each one of us. I want my prize. I used to, I used to buy Cracker Jacks. Y'all remember... Well, y'all might not remember because some of y'all are too young. Um, um, but watch this. There was a time Cracker Jack had good prizes in it. They actually, you could actually get some good stuff out of Cracker Jack. Back, 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 back in my day when Cracker Jacks were five cent a box. Amen. They, 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 you could get, watch this. When they went up, the prizes got worse. Because, man, watch this. It was caramel popcorn and peanuts. That, that's what it was. That's what Cracker Jacks was with caramel popcorn and peanuts. And, and, and did you ever get a get a Cracker Jack box, y'all, with the caramel popcorn and peanuts, and it had a bad peanut in it? It just messed up the whole box of Cracker Jacks. Just messed up the whole box. You bite that one bad peanut, and the whole box of Cracker Jacks just gone, gone down the drain. But watch this. When you saw Cracker Jacks again, because it had a prize in it. You forgot about that bad peanut. And you bought another box. You need to forget about that bad peanut. And open another box. God bless you. See you tomorrow.